thank you for having me here. Um, I'm quite thrilled to present the paper on a new congestion control algorithm, which was like lately invented by, by Google engineers. Um, so first, a little bit of an outline. I want to like describe why I actually present this paper and why I think it's actually like worthwhile and interesting for like people who have like a touch with networking to look into that. Um, I will give a little bit of a context because like maybe not everyone like knows why and how we do congestion control and why this paper is especially even more interesting given that like the history of, of what happened in, in congestion control protocol. Then we will discuss the actual paper. Um, like I will outline the algorithm which is being used and um, in the end, which is like maybe not happening all the time, like this paper has actually working code which is being committed to the Linux kernel. So you actually are able to like try the effects and play with it yourself. And I will just like give you uh, two commands at hand like to, to do that. Um, and in the end, like some conclusion and outlook. Uh, there is like one part of conclusion is like from myself, like where I think like con where things are going to head, but also like I will present the conclusion of the paper. So as a motivation, um, I think it's one of the more like interesting and um, exciting papers that was that happened like in this decade, um, because like for a long, long time, um, nothing basically happened like a lot of things maybe happened in academic area, but they were not like practical usable. We are not implemented in code. We're just like implemented in NS2, NS3, like network simulating devices and graphs were shown, but it has not been like deployed in any way. And probably the reason for that is that um, they were shown that they could actually work very well in isolated environments. But if you put stuff like that, or like if you put different algorithms into the internet, um, things pretty much like don't work anymore. And uh, this paper actually describes an algorithm which is right now actually used already in the internet quite a lot. Um, and it's actually like modifying one of our core internet protocols, like it's TCP and basically everyone maybe is shifting nowadays even to newer protocols if you're using Google on your devices, but um, it's still one of the core protocols we have and lots of like people will be using it, I guess, for the next decades, decade. <laughs> um, so like even like small improvements like in this protocol like have a big win for, for users in terms of latency or like cost reduction in terms of if you actually manage to fully saturate your, your links and your bandwidth. And so whatever you do in TCP, whatever like improves things actually has a large scale improvement to everyone if you get, uh, if you get it um, deployed. Um, yeah, so I think it's worthwhile to look into that. Um, right. <clears throat> so let's start maybe like when the internet was born. Um, we, we, TCP basically was at the first, at the beginning, like a protocol which uh, was quite simple. It allowed you to have like a stream which by itself like made sure that you received and all data that you sent into the stream. And you didn't need to care about that if you were developing like applications. Um, it actually had some kind of congestion control, which, but which was like limited, that is window sizing, like it was limited to like, to the end, like one side was like announcing like I have that much bytes available in my buffer and uh, the other side could just like fill up the buffer. But at no point in time like was the network looking, was the network playing a role in that. So if the network was actually con congested because of like too many flows were walking, going over a link, um, the network got clocked. And it happened like in 1986, I think, that actually like the network got so bad in handling the congestion on the links that um, the speed in the, um, in the Science Foundation backbone dropped from 32 kilobit to 40 bit per second. So basically what, what happened is that the good put, the good put is like actually the throughput of like valuable information uh, in comparison to retransmission or whatsoever what was occurring on the network um, got so bad that the network was basically clogged with retransmissions of TCP trying to actually get the data to the other side that the network was basically unusable. At the time, Van Jacobsen um, was basically like the one who figured out the problem and he also like proposed a solution which then led 
to the first congestion control protocols, which were deployed up until 1988. And at that time, like, the network started to actually work again. <coughs> so the early congestion control protocol, famous paper, uh, Van Jacobsen and Michael Carrots, 1988, describes like basically, and that's the reason also why I find this paper so interesting, basically what we still do today, like how we detect congestion, um, which is basically just like we're looking if we lose packets along the way. So if packets are being lost, we assume that there's con congestion and we try to limit how much data we send into the network. And that worked actually really, really well. Um, there were like the first implementations like uh, um, Tau and Reno um, basically came up with this idea of like additive increase, um, multiplic multiplicative decrease. That means like we in some way try to align into a stable state where we have conditional, uh, where we have like sometimes probing effects that like we do see packet loss, packet loss, seeing packet loss in loss-based conversion control is a normal thing because we need to probe for, for more bandwidth. Um, but basically this idea like kept on like until today. So even cubic basically is still on the same layer um, or does use the same principles in congestion control. Um, it just like uses different ways to, to handle that, but the detection of, of congestion is the same. Um, one big problem what like changed recently in the internet, or not so recently, but like in the last years is that um, we, we tend to increase our buffers because at some point in time people thought about that like buffering is good for bandwidth or like good for throughput and it actually very often is good for, for throughput. So people started to like put buffers into their devices and more and more buffers were like added to ingress routers, egress router interfaces. So um, instead of like dropping data, data was actually kept in buffers and the available bandwidth was simulated to be higher or like what the probing algorithms saw was way higher than what actually like was available for some time until it got to a collapse where actually packets needed to be dropped. Um, basically this doesn't like make the algorithms instable. It just like has a problem that if you fill up buffers, you decrease, uh, you increase the latency on the link. So basically if you put more data into a buffer, the buffer itself like has a particular queue, which needs some time to actually like get depleted. So you increase latency. And nowadays, I guess everyone wants to have their web pages loaded very, very quickly. The video should like, um, just like arrive at the moment where you click on play and you don't want to wait. Um, you want to seek in the video. So basically buffering is, um, became a problem more and more. So quite a while ago, um, there was like a bufferbloat.net is a pretty good website where people came together and thought about like, okay, how can we actually fight um, buffer bloat? And one of the cool things about BBR is that it actually like helps very much in terms of like how to decrease the buffer on the links. Um, Another problem like with buffers is that if you actually have like small buffers, um, then basically your packets get very dropped very, very early. And if that happens like in bursts, basically it is very difficult for congestion control protocols that are loss based to actually like probe for your full available bandwidth. So um, also like there's something which is called the in-cast problem in, in, in networking where basically you have, a lot, you have one switch and you have like lots of servers behind it and now the granularity of like your timers in your operating system or in your hardware might actually fire at the same time. So what you do is like, if, you, if all of those um, servers suddenly start to retransmit at the same time, it could, at, even though the bandwidth is available, very well, we shortly cause bursts on your interfaces. And if you don't have buffers in there, like basically you have to drop packets. But it's not a notification that basically you're con you are congested on that link. It's just like a very, very short time where you basically have the problem of like over, like that you are oversubscribing, but you are not like really in a problematic zone where you actually need to like get down uh, or like uh, uh, lower down your transmission rate. Um, yep. 
So if we look into like the current situation, like what is being deployed right now in the internet to quickly like see the full picture is that since a few years in Linux, Cubic TCP is like the default congestion control protocol. It is loss based. It is, uh, uses a cubic function to align to the, to the loss function. I won't go into that more closely because like time is probably running out. Um, Windows uses compound TCP, which is a hybrid congestion control protocol. I will talk about like the other hybrid part a little bit later. So what does is basically it just implements like what Frank Jacobson proposed in his first paper. Plus it tries to monitor the delay uh, the round trip times between the packets. And another very famous one, but mostly never seen one is LEDBAT, which is being used by Apple, particularly for their um, updates. Um, it's delay based, so it's actually like very like, it, it, it is not fair, it just like moves away if you have like interactive traffic or if you do your normal web browsing. It's something which like just gives all the bandwidth to all the other traffic. It's just like used for unimportant data transmissions where you don't care about latency, where you don't care about like bandwidth. It just should just like transfer data when the link is idle. Um, I think Apple and BitTorrent are the only ones who are using that, but it's also like being on track for ITF standardization right now, but I didn't follow that too closely. Um, Windows will actually switch to Cubic also in the future in Windows Server, at least as far as I know. So this compound TCP where they actually used like another approach didn't seem to work that well. <coughs> so the other approach, which is like the other part of this hybrid, what Microsoft does is, is latency-based congestion control. Um, it actually came up quite early. I think the Vegas paper was one of the first paper that described um, delay-based congestion control. Um, and it actually is a good model and it actually could have worked in the internet. The problem is that in a, in a network where you have mostly like congestion control protocols deployed, which are like getting the congestion events like based on loss information, delay isn't doing any good. Like you would be like very, very, uh, you wouldn't be aggressive enough to actually get your fair slice of the network if you would use delayed-based congestion control protocol because um, while all the loss-based congestion control protocols like would back down and would like give bandwidth to others like in, as soon as they see loss on the link, as soon as you, the latency-based ones would like uh, stop sending as soon as the latency increases. So the loss-based ones would just like fill up the buffers and would just like try to get as much bandwidth as possible until they see a loss while the latency base would actually back down at the moment like where there's an influx in, in the latency. So while the concept is pretty good and it might have worked if everyone would use latency-based congestion control protocol, um, this is not going to work in the internet because like in the end, um, yeah, we can't decide what people use. Um, yeah, so it's basically not used. Um, Microsoft was probably the only one who did it, like this compound TCP. Um, basically what they did is that they have a lot of tricks in their Windows Server congestion control stack nowadays. Um, so what they do is, for example, that they actually measure their round trip time and they have like specific windows in which they use either the loss-based or the delay-based congestion control protocol. And they have further uh, tricks, for example, to discover um, data center TCP if you are in a switch that supports like, they have lots of like automatic configuration frameworks for like how to actually choose which congestion control protocol. Um, and then in Linux basically you can configure that by roots in, in Windows. They try to give you a, a UI experience in some way. Um, not that I'm like, I think it's actually quite okay what they are doing. But anyway, as I described earlier, they seem to switch to cubic but I don't actually know the details why that happened. <coughs> uh, Windows actually also implements that, but, but I don't know if they have any users on that. So let's come to the paper. <coughs> um, so congestion-based congestion control is a paper. I actually forgot where it was. Ah, it was actually proposed like 2016, and it was quite funny because it was actually first proposed in code and then uh, the paper was released. So it's more of like actually something we 
could look or look at and we could see like how, how things work like also on the code side. It's constantly improved since then. So basically there, if you want to use BBR, um, there's actually also a new version on its way, which I won't go into this talk, but you could look out for that. Um, it has been done and developed and implemented by lots of great people. Its name BBR is, stands for bottleneck bandwidth and round trip propagation time. Um, it doesn't get like said that often, so I also like try to keep it uh, on the slide nine. <laughs> so let's look into like quickly how how we can model a queue. Um, basically. Uh, we have a few properties, which is like that, yeah. TCP can, can see like the full connection even so it's going along uh, several routers and whatsoever. It can like, you can look at the connection as like one single pipe. It's not like that we actually need to model like the routers in between or we need to keep state on the routers and when the routers change that we need to like take any actions. We just like basically need to look out for basic physical properties which is one is like uh, the IG prop, which is the round trip propagation time. Basically it's like telling us like how, how long we need to wait until like we get a response from, from the other peer. And the other one is the bottleneck bandwidth. Um, the bottleneck bank bandwidth is like, you can imagine that in this uh, slide like as, as, a, as a diameter of the pipe, it is actually like the bottleneck bandwidth of the minimum of all the paths you have. So if you have like a smaller path in between your big network, like that is the bottleneck bandwidth. bandwidth. That is the place where you basically have the buffer bloat. Like the queues will be formed just on the ingress interface of this particular buffer. And we try to reduce the amount of queuing that happens there. Um, furthermore, like if you look into like the in-flight, data you can have on this particular pipe. It is the multiplication of like the bottleneck, bottleneck bandwidth times the round trip propagation time, which is like, if you like dimensions like bits per second times second, so we end up in bits, which is like the amount of data that you have like in the pipe at one particular time. That's what is being tracked in TCP stacks as in-flight data. So that is a data that is like on the flight, has been sent out, but has not been acknowledged by the other side. <clears throat> um, so basically the story behind like how BBR come up is like what they like wrote a little bit in the paper is that um, they were basically all the time when they were looking at packet traces, those were the two variables like that actually matter to them most of the time. So if they looked at two TCP traces and wanted to like dissect why something is broken, that's how they try to characterize the links. But for example, if you look into the current Linux kernel, we don't actually track anything like the bottleneck bank bandwidth. We, we have RGT measurements that's in TCP like for when we decide also when the loss happens, which is a huge over estimation, but we don't actually have a good uh, estimation like of a very narrow like bandwidth, uh, around the propagation time and we don't track really the bandwidth of, of, of the link. But as engineers, they saw like, okay, those are really like the fu two fundamental variables which we need to measure like how much data we can keep in the pipe. So yeah, it's important to see that um, if we put in-flight, if we have in-flight data in the pipe, we don't overwhelm, we don't build up queues. Basically, we are just like at the sweet spot, like how much data we should keep in the network. Um, I copied a small like screen, uh, a small diagram from the paper. <clears throat> so um, what is important now is to understand several things. Um, so we have like the round trip propagation time being seen here. So uh, here you can see the amount of in-flight data. And those are actually two diagrams. You see the delivery rate here and the round trip time is over, is over here. Um, so what you see is that at this point, we are, um, we are sending now data into the network. So we increase the delivery rate 
slowly given a specific startup like procedure in BBR. And while we do that, we have a constant round trip propagation time. That is because like at the moment where we don't exceed or where we don't like push too much data into the network, we always, we are guaranteed to not like over exhaust it. We are guaranteed to not build up queues. So what we can do is like we see a constant and very good approximation of the round trip propagation time without like any queues building up. And at the point where like we actually reach the point where we, where the bottleneck bandwidth is reached. So we are now pushing that much data into the network that we hit this point where the bottleneck bandwidth is being reached. We see that the round trip propagation time is going up. That means like we are increasing now the latency of the link. And um, so that is important to track because like we, we know that we can measure like bandwidth in this section where we actually have enough data to always like keep the network busy. That is where we can measure the bandwidth of a link. While in the area where we actually don't have enough data to keep the link busy, we can measure the round trip propagation time because the links, uh, the queues are not there yet. Um, yeah. And if you look into that, basically you see that uh, a best operating point is where, so over here, just quickly, is, is like where the buffers are being exceeded. So we are pushing more and more, more, more and more data into the network. And at some point, like even the buffers are getting full. And at that point, we are starting to drop packets. And that is basically this point. And if you like follow the discussion, um, loss based congestion control protocols actually operate here. So they start to notice that the link is congested at the point where the buffers are full and packets are being dropped. Um, while it would actually be great to actually not fill up the buffers, but just like operate furthermore down this line where we know that the round trip propagation time is actually influencing how much data we, we send into the network. <clears throat> it's important, yeah, uh, another thing is, it could also be the case that we don't have enough data to actually fill up the pipe. In that case, we must keep state that we have samples or we are sampling data where we don't have enough data to fill up the pipe. So we must discard those particular like samples later on when we measure like how much bandwidth we actually have. <clears throat> so to conclude from the previous slide, we, arrive, we are arriving at those um, oper optimal operating points over here when the following conditions are being met. The bottleneck bottleneck uh, packet ar arrival rate equals the bottleneck bandwidth. So we are pushing just as much data into the network as a bottleneck neck is possible to transport or to, to transmit further along the way. And where we basically have like, the total data in flight is basically our bottleneck bandwidth times the round trip propagation time, which basically is our bandwidth delay product. If both of them are being fulfilled, we end up being at this optimal sweet spots over here. <clears throat> the problem is like, uh, anecdote from the paper is that it has been proven that those are actually the sweet spots. So it's actually like what you should try to reach. But on the other side, it has been proven around the same time that those particular, that it's impossible to find an algorithm, or it's impossible to find an algorithm that actually like can get or like can guarantee that you are operating on those sweet spots. So what happened in the ITF, like lots of more effort was being put not into congestion control, but we suddenly saw uh, uh, the ACM, the uh, ACM work, working group was like being formed and lots of effort has been put like into also active congestion control along the way and also like trying to get like ECN, accelerated ECN, single bit, multi bit, um, congestion control protocol working. Apple, for example, is not going like BBR, but they are nowadays trying to push ECN, like active uh, involvement of routers into congestion control protocol on the way. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, as discussed, like we should ba basically add code to the, to, to the TCP stack to, to measure both um, the bottleneck bandwidth and the round trip propagation time and just like use those to actually like get closer to this optimum sweet spot to send data. 
Um, so basically, it looks complicated. I basically copied it from the paper. It basically just says like, okay, we have a sliding window, and in those sliding windows, we estimate a specific round trip propagation time, and we estimate a specific bandwidth. The round trip propagation time is basically, um, the, the estimated round trip propagation time is our round trip propagation time plus the noise we have around it. So this um, noise is, is basically, you can observe it basically always in the network where like things suddenly like reroute in the network. Also you have different stacks that suddenly delay packets. Uh, you have middle boxes that play with particular uh, request response packets, act packets and so on. So you basically always have, have noise. So what you in the end try to do is like you have some kind of, you try to estimate the minimum round trip time for a particular window in time and you just take that as a estimated round trip propagation time. Um, for the bottleneck bandwidth, we just like say, okay, we also have a window and we just like calculate the delivery, the maximum of the delivery rate we saw in that particular window. And we can do that by keeping state on the packets we sent out and we are getting back. So we basically, uh, Get a, we actually get the exact estimate of like how much data we send out into the network by watching like which egg packets, which eggs we, are, which we receive, because the sequence numbers and egg numbers actually tell us exactly like how many bytes have been acknowledged by the other peer. Um, so we just need to guess a little bit on the delta t, um, which we can't do that well because like we have like particular like those egg delays for example, but it's a pretty good estimate that BBR can, can actually work on. <clears throat> yeah, so some more state has to be added to the Linux kernel to now be able to find run the very uh, track those those packets. <clears throat> like described before, like sending at the steady state is great, but you need to also be careful like if queues have built up before because like we could have like over subscribed or like over um, used the pass too much and we actually don't want to have queues. So we actually need a way to actually, first of all, to get rid of out of queues because like if the system is in a steady state, nothing will change. Then the network itself also changes. So we have like routing pass changes, which very much like change like how, how the bandwidth or the round trip time is, is uh, what round trip time and what um, bandwidth is available. Even like for example, if you just like move away from the access point, like suddenly you get into a much less, you get much less bandwidth to the access point and your whole uh, congestion control system needs to adapt to that quite quickly. <clears throat> and as I said before, like we can observe the propagation time, but we can't see the bandwidth other and vice versa. So we can't measure both of them. Um, so we need to like find a way to, to deal with those problems. <clears throat> So what we do now when, when we basically send out data and we receive the ACK, which basically acknowledges our data, is that we can now estimate like when we send out the packet and we receive the packet back, we can calculate a round trip time and we can like feed this round trip time into like um, a round trip time est estimation um, into a, a filter, which basically like tries to keep track on, of the round trip time. Um, and we also like can now try to update our delivery rate estimates. Like if the first important thing is like that we need to check if we got a higher or we measured higher bandwidth than before, then we basically can always like use this particular um, sample that we got from this egg packet. If, but if for example, if we couldn't actually fill up the pipe completely, um, then we need to be careful because like in, we would actually get a lower estimate for the bandwidth, but because like we were not actually able to full fill up the, the packet, we need to discard this particular sample. But it could be like that we could fill up the pipe and we get a lower bandwidth, then we would need to actually decrease the bottleneck bank bandwidth in this case. <clears throat> okay. Um, so on the sending side is, it's basically like we need to keep also a little bit more state. I need to update some more state. Uh, yep. So 
when we send a packet, we need to like store the timestamp of the particular packet to make sure that we can actually calculate the correct round trip time when we get the, um, the ARC back for that particular packet. Um, and we need to check like that the packet is not like application limited so that we don't, that we have enough data available to actually like fill up the whole window that the congestion control window gives us at that particular point. <clears throat> and another very, very important thing now is that we actually need to also make the packets appear smoothly being sent into the pipe because like lots of older congestion control protocols or like or TCP implementations were basically sending in bursts. So basically what happened is that you got some X back, maybe they were like even closer to each other and suddenly like the TCP stack saw like, okay, I have like lots of window open now and was like sending a big burst into the network. Um, this, this big burst would like in the long run not, not form any kind of queues, but if uh, it would microscopically like form queues at the moment like where the burst actually hits like the queues. So the idea is like to not form queues and to keep the latency constant is that uh, pacing had to be implemented in some way that the rate with which TCP would send into the network was like completely constant all the time. This was also added to the Linux kernel around uh, actually before BBR was actually in integrated and was then reused. <coughs> <clears throat> so looking at um, when we send out packets and we receive packets, uh, the goal was like those two slides basically show we need to keep a little bit more state along the way to actually end up in a steady state behavior where we can um, be, where we can not, where we can find a way to not have queues and still fill up bandwidth. And uh, yeah, so what you saw like from the last two slides is that we, end, we actually only control the sending side. So we just like update a few filters and do a few measurements when we receive packets. But the whole logic is actually on the sending side. And we basically just like take those two variables I'm talking about um, the whole time. But the bottleneck bandwidth and route propagation time as input. And we build a control loop out of that so that we can always estimate uh, good values for both of those variables. Um, to fight against the problem that we only can observe one of those variables at the same time, we need to actually start to do probing along the way. So we basically need to lower and higher the bandwidth or the, the sending rate with which we throw data into the network to, f to see like if any of those other variables change over time and then take their input as possible changes in the network and into account. <coughs> Any questions so far, maybe? Mm -hmm. <coughs> so, um, to, to actually like try to find bandwidth, what we can actually do is like, obviously we just push more data into the network. And the implementation and the paper introduces a variable which is called pacing gain. And what it does, it just like multiplies the pacing, the pacing gain with the variable which controls the pacing rate and uses this to control how much data is being sent into the network all the time. And it basically just like keeps it constant and it suddenly starts to increase uh, so pacing gain is being one, means like it's being kept constant. And from time to time, it increases the pacing gain. So it tries to actually push more data into the network. That is mostly like a value of 1.25 is being used. So it just like starts to, to increase like how much data it pushes into the network. And it can now observe like if any other variable changes. So if like it sees, for example, the round trip time is not being, is not going to change, but at the same time, the bandwidth is going up we actually can use this bandwidth. But if at the same time we see the bandwidth going up, but our latency is also going up, just by observing that it will like even out in the end because like we see uh, more bandwidth with a higher latency divided by each other is like basically a non, no change in the, in the protocol. Um, the problem with that is that 
after we increased the pacing gain to actually probe for more bandwidth, in the, we could have built up queues and we could have clocked the network. And while then TCP con congestion control is in steady state, um, as we learned, like we won't like kill those um, queues anymore. We actually need to decrease the pacing gain for the same amount like we increased it to make sure that we don't leave any queues of this probing along the way. So um, we can see this pretty good in this diagram. We have the cycle gain factor on here and it's being multiplied by our current um, pacing rate. So at particular times in the cycle, the pacing, the cycle gain will increase and we are starting to push more data in flight. We are pushing more data into the network. And on this, in this diagram, you can observe like that at that time, at the same time, the round trip time will go up. Um, obviously, like we need to wait until the X, like the, the packets received come back from the network to actually see that we increase the latency. And at that time, we notice, okay, we have a small increase in, in the maximum bottle at bank bandwidth but our round trip time is going away, so we don't actually can use too much of the spend list. So the increase of the used throughput of the, th of the used um, band list is actually around the same. Um, just we had a, we filled up a queue here now because we increased like the amount of data inside the network. And to fight against that, right after this period, we, we see like that the, net, that the cycle gain is switched to 0 0.75, which basically, drops the amount of data that is being sent into the network to drain the queues that have been built along the way. And it uses then steady state until this whole process starts again. It tries to probe for more bandwidth for a short time, short amount of time, sees which parameters changes, calculates the new, um, the new um, variables from that, decreases it to, to fight against any queues, and goes along in steady state. If we, for example, have a bandwidth increase, so we see in this diagram, we see an increase of um, 10 megabit. Is it 10? 20 megabit. Um, then we see like how the cycle slowly adapts the congestion control to the newly learned bandwidth. That happens here in three cycles, uh, around like one, dot two five four to three um, what it takes and it adapts quite quickly to that and other congestion control protocols depending on the actual alignment of like how you use the information about the losses it could be either faster or slower but the faster algorithms were like deemed to be said to be too aggressive so what BBR achieves is like it can be aggressive because it knows basically um, it knows that it, it can only do that so long as the round trip time doesn't change. Because like it has to back down at the moment like when round trip time changes. Other congestion control protocols don't do that. Um, in the lower diagram, we see a reduction of, um, of bandwidth. So we see that when like bandwidth is being reduced, we see a sudden, sudden spike in the amount of data we have in flight because like we fill up buffers. And in this case, um, the bottom bandwidth is, is increasing as well as the round trip time is also like the measured round trip time is increasing also a lot. And at the moment where like the round trip time samples um, invalidate because of like the measured time window is, is going out of scope, we see that basically um, BBR is very quickly adapting to the new bandwidth and is trying to remove all the queues and all the latency along the way. So latency is going down constantly and BBR is constantly probing like for new, um, for new bandwidth and, and sees like, okay, bandwidth is, is not available and, and scales down. <coughs> so that is basically the steady state behavior, which is quite simple. It's just like going up, going down and trying to fight, figure out the sweet spot where um, the congestion control protocol should, uh, yeah, in, in which, how much data should be pushed into the network at each particular point in time. <clears throat> One important thing nowadays is 
like how to actually start up connections. Um, that's particularly interesting because like in the early days, like starting up a connection was quite easy because like you didn't have like too much bandwidth so you could just like slowly increase it. But nowadays like with Linux has support for 100 gigabit network cards, um, connections can become quite the, the speeds are quite high, so you actually want to also ramp up your connection quite quickly. Um, so what BBR does is it uses basically binary search for that. So logarithmically, it like gets to the sweet spot of like in, in the, uh, the um, binary logarithm in the amount of uh, BDP one tip times, and uh, that is actually quite fast. And, but it's comparable to what we have like in loss-based uh, congestion control protocols. The problem just like also in loss-based congestion control protocols is that it leaves like quite a lot of data in the queues because we overestimate the available bandwidth for quite some time until like we figure out, okay, we need to actually level down in our um, sending rate. So after like, that's why after we found the spot of like where to settle down, um, BBR actually enters uh, the state after the, the startup state is like the drain state where it goes into the inverse of the gain rate. So it just like reverses one um, divided by two divided by look, um, natural logarithm of two and tries to empty the queue it has built up during the startup phase. And after that it will settle like or go into the normal steady state phase where it just like tries to um, probe for more bandwidth and also like for more round trip time. <coughs> so startup happens and after the startup we are hopefully in a state where we end up being, we, where we can transmit without any queues. <coughs> An example of that is basically also like in comparison with congestion control protocols which use loss as input is uh, the red line is, uh, is pubic which is the current default congestion control protocol while the green line is TCP BBR, and the blue line is what the receiver sees, like how it sees the packets coming in, and which is basically just like very smooth because like it's behind the bottleneck. bottleneck. Um, so what you see is that basically cubic stays pretty much stable and uh, linear along the line. Um, where at this point BBR actually sees that, okay, it has like reach the sweet spot um, and everything like what cubic puts more into the network is like basically filling up queues while BBR is actually slowing down and tries to adapt and tries to, to get closer to what actually the blue line is here. So it adapts to the speed with which actually the receiver sees the data, data coming in to, uh, and if they actually would fit exactly on top of each other that it's actually the, the best situation because at that point we push data into the network and at the, on the other end, like the receiver is taking the data exactly like in the same speed out of the network so we don't build up any queues. Um, basically we see the round trip time in the lower graph is, is like we, we see also a huge increase in, in round trip time along the way when we do the um, startup but after, after a while, BBR adapts to that in the steady state and, and lowers its, um, its pacing speed, while cubic in this case like, would just like, go along and fill up the buffers until like, it hits actually the congestion and lowers down. <coughs> um, that is like basically looking at BBR so we looked at BBR so far just like on its own, but interesting, it gets interesting when actually congestion control when you have multiple connections on the same link. Um, and that's actually where one very interesting feature of BBR shows up, which is like it, it kind of does some synchronization between all the different like computers which share the network. Um, there's a state I haven't like talked about so far, which is like we also want to measure a good round trip time that is like we want to actually at one point lower the um, amount of data we send into the network and measure a good sample for like how much, how long does actually a packet need to being sent and being like received back like in the egg packet from the other side. And that is basically, that happens 
not that often, like every 10 or 15 seconds after uh, the RGT samples um, are inverted. Like it's being said like, okay, around for 10 seconds, we keep like, we have a good estimate for, road, for the round trip time and after that we need to like measure again. Um, and the measuring, like, this only happens like after 10 seconds where we updated the RGT for the last time, which means like we got a lower sample for the link. Um, that is particularly interesting because when a link starts to actually send less packets into the network, all other connections will also see a lower round trip time. So they start to update their filters at the same time. Um, that particular means that also like they will have a synchronized timeout the next, the next time because like they had seen the same event in the past. So they, are, they will invalidate the RGT samples like together at the same time where all of them at the same time will reduce the amount of data they send into the net network. So what comes out of it is that you, that basically the network and all congestion controls or BBR congestion controls will at the same time remove, re, uh, reduce the amount of data and will get a better and better and more clear picture of the round trip time in the network than any other protocol could do. So like some, some technical details. So we, it's in the paper described to reduce it to a constant of like four TCP packets which are being injected into the network and the round trip time is being measured by those packets. And um, exactly like I described before, like we, we time out the RGT samples after a while and um, that is being like self-synchronized and with that basically all those flows will at some point get into synchronized state where RGT is pretty much uh, a good approximation of, of the link. We can see this in this particular diagram like where multiple BBR flows are being shared on the same link and after a while um, you see like that the reduction of bandwidth happens at the same time and that is like where the RGT sampling happens uh, for all those streams. <clears throat> so this particular algorithm has been implemented in the Linux kernel um, and the cool thing about like Google upstreaming things is that they mostly have tested it quite a lot in the data centers so the technology was I think being used in for quite some links inside the Google One network and it showed like incredible good results and the paper said like they hadn't had any regressions. That's quite impressive. Um, and I don't know what the current state is like how far Google has pushed it out. I, I think like Google Chrome OS and Android devices like end devices don't do BBR so far which is also um, not really necessary because like as we saw it's a sending side only algorithm and we just want to eat data from Google, we don't want to send them data. Um, so I think that Google, the paper described that YouTube, some of the connections from YouTube to you are already using BBR, they're using some particular percentage which is probably adapted all the time and um, they're saying like basically it works pretty pretty good. Um, there are some problems actually which they discovered along the way. So it's not all like totally great and you should like just switch BBR on by default but some areas need improvement. So those imperfections so far is that people notice that if you actually don't have buffer bloat along the way and that you have very very shallow buffers that BBR actually overestimates and pushes more data into the network than actually available and so um, it causes a, actually storms of packet drops and that is basically why Google is now investing resources into like developing BBR version 2 and whoever is interested in that could like follow the slides from the recent IETF meetings just like a few weeks ago um, where they talk about like introducing some new features like for example actually listening to, to packet loss what they didn't do before to, to um, help with those problems. Um, there's some, I didn't understand it actually completely, but there are some problems in the ramp up phase, which is, as I discussed earlier, quite aggressive, that some flows actually have some unfair advantages over other flows and they actually don't synchronize into the steady state, but 
are being handled like more favored to the network. And lots of problems like emerge in the area where middle boxes are along the way which um, play with the TCP ticking of the network. So you see, for example, in like lots of old network devices where uh, lo lots of old mobile network networks, mobile networks where you have uh, lots of buffers inside the mobile stations and they basically uh, corrupt the way how um, uh, BBR can measure latency because, for example, they compress ACs into, so multiple ACs, which would give a good estimate for the round trip time, are being compressed like into one ACK. So basically what you see is like a much longer RTT, even so like the round trip time is way, way shorter and it's being done to actually reduce the amount of like uh, the uh, air usage, like the amount of time the air is like being used just for communicating packet overhead. Um, also some policing systems like billing systems, token bucket filter and so on, confuse BBR because like they suddenly like change bandwidths and what you can pump through the network without you, with, without a really a model of a pipe in, in behind. So they are confusing um, the estimates. And the answer to that is probably that BBR at some point in time will actually model those middle boxes into the algorithm and then they will detect, ah, there's a token bu bucket filter along the way, which is a bottleneck and I will try to, to work around that. Um, yeah, so as I said, it is actually a paper which is implemented in the Linux kernel and you can use it even today. It's considered stable. Um, what is a little bit different is that um, you actually need to do this pacing and this pacing is not being done, is now, uh, uh, the pacing is normally being done in the, QDisk layer, which is like a packet scheduling layer, which sits directly on the network interface side. So what you need to do is like, you need to remove your packet scheduler with this command on the particular interface to install the fair queue. And then the TCP stack will actually use information or will actually push information down to the, to the fair queue on how the packet should be paced. Um, since some kernel versions, there is a fallback mechanism. So if you have a quite recent kernel, which is along like 414, 413, you actually don't need to do this anymore, but it's still like the most high speed, like the most appropriate way to actually handle lots of TCP sessions. So if you are just like pumping data out of the network, you should definitely use the QDisk with uh, fair, the QDisk fair queue. Otherwise you could also like just enable BBR. Enabling BBR by default is basically just like load the kernel module and just set the particular SysCTL ProcFS entry as your default and that's it. You don't need to do anything more. And all connections after that particular command that are being set up will use BBR as default for sending. Um, yeah, so the cool thing about BBR is basically that there were lots of approaches or like lots of ideas how to do congestion control. I discussed um, loss-based congestion control, I, we looked into latency-based uh, congestion control, there were single-bit, multi-bit congestion controls like ECN, SL, accelerated ECN, et, et cetera, which are being looked at by Apple, but no one of them actually like ac was being used in the internet. For example, ECN has been, would have been great. The problem was that actually lots of when routers, especially from Cisco, had bugs that if they saw an ECN packet, they just dropped it. And like even if it wasn't like marked, even just if it was a packet along the way, so you suddenly, if you used ECN in the early days, you had black holes in the internet where you couldn't connect to some, I, I know some university where you couldn't connect to if you had ECN enabled because the uh, egress, in, uh, the, the main router of the university was uh, not, was dropping basically all ECN traffic. Um, allegedly it became much better nowadays because like hardware gets replaced after time, but uh, there are like, most of the hardware might end up somewhere else, so we just probably are shifting those ECM black holes around. So ECN wasn't like a huge success. Um, Latency-based congression control protocols weren't also a huge success. Hybrid solutions were pretty complex, and I don't know if anything besides Windows had like bigger deployment, and that Windows is moving now to Cubic also tells a story that um, it might not have been a good idea to use a hybrid one. I don't know the details about it. 
Um, at the same time, we have like new protocols coming up, which is TLS version 1.3 and HTTP 2. Um, what is notable here is that HTTP specifically like allows you to push like more traffic into one TCP connection by multiplexing the data streams inside them. So it might become more interesting in terms of like having one speedy, good established TCP connection where all the data for one particular website is like um, um, sent over. TLS 1.3 I mentioned here because um, the ramp up phase is important because like the TLS handshake is quite big and you want to like submit it as fast as possible without waiting. Um, there's also like a zero RTT handshake basically which allows you to send like your request like in the first TCP packets and so you actually want to have a fast ramp up, ramp up page um, to do that. Nowadays it's actually quite easy because the congestion windows are quite large in the beginning of um, a TCP negotiation. Um, there's lots of talk nowadays also about QUIC um, but in terms of like talking about congestion control protocols, QUIC will probably just like use BBR also because like the problem is not like going away with QUIC even just if you switch to UDP. You still don't want to congest the network so um, the only thing what I could believe is that QUIC is mostly developed in user space. So I think uh, Google has it in the Chrome browser, like there will probably be like independent libraries sometime soon. Um, it's easier to develop in the user space, particularly if you want to use like floating point units or if you want to use databases or like maybe artificial intelligence algorithms. So we might see actually new ways of doing like congestion control um, in the future as more stuff shifts to user space. I don't know. Um, yeah, with that, I want to conclude the talk and I think I'm done and would like to answer questions now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now we'll go ahead and take questions. Uh, there'll be folks with microphones. I'll raise your hand. Someone will come to you and then you can ask your question. If there are any. There we go. All right. There's some smoke come up. Uh, this guy right here in the, pl in the plaid. Er, well, <laughs> sorry. We'll get you next. You know. Yeah, so I was curious about the um, Linux kernel implementation. Are there any other like performance impacts associated with uh, these implementations, like either the fair uh, you had to make modify QDisk, yep. um, or uh, the additional timekeeping that you need to be doing in kernel space? Does that have any, any actual impact on performance? No. <laughs> We right. keep the, so Easy. no, no, no. The measurement is being done anyway for all packets because the congestion control framework is like uh, is is a pluggable system nowadays where the kernel modules actually implement that, and because like the data is being passed from the core kernel down into the modules, it's available nowadays anyway. So, and also like getting timestamps is not too much of a big problem nowadays because like they are updated by the interrupts. So you just like read them from a pair of CPU variable and, and keep them. So for time stamping, I, I doubt that there's like anything you can see. Um, I think actually like if you compare it to Cubic, BBR does less computation along the way than Cubic because like it needs to like build up a Cubic uh, a curve without using FPU and like doing crazy bit shifts along the way to estimate that. So I could actually imagine that your performance with BBR in terms of computation on the sending side is slower is, is, is lower than, than with other congestion control protocols. FQ does have some overhead, um, that's true. But I would assume that the Android side, the good throughput, good put you actually receive is, is, is worth it. So FQ basically can quickly explain it is basically just the model that you take, uh, the, that you extract the flow, that you identify a flow, you put it into a radix tree, and then you minimize the sojour time of that of those packets. So basically what you do is like you try to balance the uh, time a flow can send to all flows that are currently like um, routed over the particular network device. <coughs> I think we had a question back here. Uh, I'm curious whether in the uh, the paper, your own thoughts, uh, were there any experiments 
operating in mixed mode routes where there was an network device that was had senders that were using both BBR and traditional loss-based um, congestion control, because I could imagine BBR would back off sooner. Um, and would that favor the loss-based congestion control senders? Um, yeah, B BBR does, does uh, yeah, I actually didn't include them because I thought like I would run out of time. So BBR still has like developments to do and it could, it does back off earlier than uh, additional loss-based ones because like it, they don't try to fill up the pipe while the loss-based one doesn't really care. But uh, the other point is that BBR is actually like accelerating faster than after the slowdown. So um, it's actually quite difficult. There are, I think, three different conditions uh, one needs to take in mind. So if there is a slowdown, if you have a packet loss, and then packet loss is not that constantly occurring, BBR just like keeps sending, while even this one particular packet loss would cause the loss-based one to go down. So if you calculate how many packets you actually need to lose on a particular pass to slow down um, cubic to basically not deliver any data, data anymore. It's not too many packets. Why BBR would just like be on top of that. So if you anyway get into like situations where you fight against each other, uh, I agree that for the first time like cubic would probably win. But I think that the good put you would receive on the BBR pass could be higher with BBR just because like it accelerates faster or it, it, it actually ignores some losses which Cubic actually sees as, okay, I'm really congested here. I need to like slow down a lot and uh, half my window sizes and so on and so on. There are lots of discussions and uh, BBR dev list is also like interesting. And uh, yeah, I, I can't give a conclusive answer to that. It's probably, you need to test it because like dynamic systems behave non-deterministically anyway, so difficult to answer. <coughs> Other questions? We have a couple over here, it looks like. I was curious, how do you define uh, a flow as going to the same place? In FQ terms, it's basically uh, IP addresses and port numbers, and that's it. So those four things, it's a quadruple which is being extracted and then hashed and put into uh, the Redix tree as a key. The discussions of adding stuff like flow labels in IPv6, um, everyone is saying something else what you could add into a flow. But basically, uh, in, in modern clouds, you also put like VXLAN identifier and VLAN identifier and so on into the, into the flow key. Um, but in the model, like it's just like your quadruple. Uh, sorry, five tuple protocol, but it's anyway just TCP, but in FQ it matters. Any other questions? <clears throat> if not, we'll wrap it up. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.